Stay seated for just a second. Uh, man, how about that worship team? That was awesome. Uh, I was just, I was thinking, you know, I, I started on worship teams when I was probably 13, 14, and I was not that good, like, at all. And so that was awesome. I was, like, just standing over there in awe, like, wow, this is amazing. The voices, the youth on the instruments, they're doing awesome. And God's, God's doing amazing things in our youth um, and our kids' ministry. Um, I don't know if you all realize that, but I just want to, can we just give a clap for Sharla and Lindsay? Um, I just, I... I say that around here at New Wine, like God's presence is the center of, of everything we do. And I just want you to know that there's challenges and difficulties that come with that. Um, it's literally, it, it really is a Jesus take the wheel type of thing. And as people, we always like to feel in control deep down that's in our nature. And uh, Charlotte and Lindsay have just really stepped up to the plate to say, we're going we're gonna to focus around God and his presence, and he wants to do come what may. That's what we're going to be targeting in our kids and youth. And so thank you guys so much for doing that. And I think we see a lot of, obviously, a lot of fruit um, from your ministries. So how you doing? Okay. It's a little quiet in here for all the kids being in here. Kids, are you out there? Okay. A guy looking to buy a horse sees that a pastor has a horse for sale. He goes to the pastor to check the horse out, and he wants to give it a test ride first. The preacher says, fine, but there are some things you need to know. To get the horse to move, you have to say, praise the Lord. To get the horse to stop, you have to say, hallelujah. The man says, that's easy enough, and climbs onto the horse, and he says, praise the Lord, and the horse starts walking. They get out on a dirt road, and the man decides to really try the horse out. He wonders how fast this horse can run. So he says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and the horse takes off running. The man looks up and notices they're heading straight for a cliff. The man panics and begins yelling, whoa, horse, stop, whoa, but the horse keeps on running. Just as they get close to the cliff, the guy remembers the command to stop, and he cries out, Hallelujah! And the horse stops right at the edge of the cliff. The guy looks over the cliff and says, Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, let's stand. I'm going to invite Isaiah and Keen out here for the reading of Scripture and prayer. Ephesians 2, 14 through 22. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing walls of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressing, I mean expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile both God is one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father, so, that, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Build on Christ's foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure began, 
mean being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. In him you are also to be built together into a dwelling place by God the Spirit. Um, before I pray, I just want to say um, I had a whole prayer ready, ready and then um, God just told me I'm going to tell you what you need to say. So I placed it down. And here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, just please allow us to um, be that temple inside of you um, and allow us to grow within you. And thank you for having peace inside of our bodies, um, even through uh, all our debt. Um, And make sure that that temple allows our spirit to be impenetrable by your love. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> One thing that has been extremely attacked in our culture is our ability to live for the future and to see what we're setting up for future generations. And in the time we're in now, and the political climate we're in now, and the state of our nation, it is really important that we as God's people reclaim and understand we are called to build a foundation for generations to come. Not just during our time, not just during uh, the time of our kids, but our grandkids and great-grandkids. We're setting up for that. This is, it's part of the wiring of human beings that we are supposed to go through challenge and difficulty to set us up for the reward that is to come. Let me give you an example. For all of human history, to eat, we have had to go and hunt and farm, bring the the ingredients in, cook the meal, add the spices, go through the whole process, the whole challenge, and then at the end of it, you receive the reward of a good meal. Now, we don't have to do that anymore, do we? You can get the reward instantly. Fast food, scrolling on your phone, TV, Nothing in our world sets us up to go through the natural process of there's going to be some struggle, there's going to be some tension, but at the end, the reward is going to be released. That is gone in our culture. And here's the thing, Christianity and Christians and followers of Jesus have always lived in that reality and that process to an extreme because they have looked out and said the reward is way off in the future It's the kingdom of God coming. It's the time when there's no more tears, no more mourning. It's when our world is made right. But Christians have always stood with endurance, as Paul says, steadfastness to say, we will go through this process for hundreds of years, thousands of years, knowing what the reward is. But we have lost that vision. It's called the blessed hope. It's the hope of Christianity. We will endure. We will go through struggle. We will stand knowing what's coming on the other side. Instead of that, though, we have often become people who are just fixated on our little time and space. Our little one foot by one foot square of dirt we occupy is all we are concerned about. We've become like a king in the Old Testament named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a good king, but he became ill at one point, and he was going to die, and he begged God to save him, and God did. But then Hezekiah has this interaction with the prophet Isaiah in 2 Kings verse 20 or chapter 20 verse 16 it says then Isaiah said to Hezekiah hear the word of the Lord 
Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So the prophet comes and says, troubling times are coming. Some of your sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. They will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good. Because he thought, why not if there's peace and security in my day? His heart became, who cares what happens to my sons and their sons and my daughters and their daughters, my kingdom. I'm not going to be around to see it as long as there's peace in my day. And you know what happened? His son Manasseh became one of the worst kings Israel ever saw. And his son Ammon became just as bad. Because there was this root in the heart of Hezekiah, as long as things are good while I'm here, I'm good. God is calling us today, as you look around and you see all the young people in here, to stand and recognize that is not the heart God wants us to have. God wants us to have a heart that says, no, I would rather go through the trouble and the tension, horrific things in my day, so that grandkids and great-grandkids that I may never see, may never know, have a certain kind of blessed world that they are living in. We're called to lift our eyes to look ahead and to see and to hope for generations to come. We live in a world where there's great trouble, but we are building for the kingdom of God. Now let me be clear, we're not building the kingdom of God. That thing's already built, it already exists. It's coming here. We're building for the kingdom to come. What does that look like? Revelation 21, 2 through 4 is a great place to start. John the Revelator says this. He says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, John uses the symbol of a city on purpose. Remember, we're in a a um, series on politics, and the Greek word city is polis, where we get politics. I saw a polis coming out of heaven, a society, a culture. It's the new Jerusalem. And he says, I heard, verse uh, 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, neither shall there be mourning, crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. This is the hope that we are to look towards. This is the hope Christians of thou for thousands of years have looked towards and what they have lived their lives building for. Our world is different than it has been for the past few decades at least. And the question I want to ask is how do we as God's people give hope, build for the kingdom in a world like ours that is so divided, so dark, getting darker, getting more and more divided? What do we do as God's people in this world that we live in. Well, Paul says this, Ephesians 2, 21, section out of the passage we just read. It describes the church this way, God's people this way, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. All of us joined together grow into a holy temple. 
What I want us to understand is to bring transformation and hope to our world, we as God's people need unity and holiness. Unity and holiness. That's the title of my message today. How do you look different from a world and show the world a different way when it's so polarized, so divided? Well, you're going to have to push for, stand for, fight for unity in God's people. Also, you have to look different from a morally corrupt world, a world where morality continues to break apart. To look different in a morally corrupt world, you must stand, fight for holiness. We will have to have both. Again, remember, we're talking about building for generations to come. If you want to leave a world that is under the blessing of God, not just for yourself, not just for your kids, but for your grandkids and your great-grandkids and your great-great-great-grandkids in generations to come. We must have unity and holiness in the body of Christ. Now, of course, there's an easy way to do unity. I call it sissy unity. Kids don't go home saying that word. But unity's very easy if you don't care about holiness. Everybody just gets together. Anything goes. There's no boundaries. We see this happen in churches all the time. Well, everybody's here. Everybody's welcome here. Come as you are. Stay as you are. We're unified. We're unifying around everything. That's really easy. There's no holiness. It's easy unity, it's not biblical unity. On the flip side, holiness is super easy when you don't care about unity. You just split over every disagreement. Hello? You just pack up your bags and say, I don't agree with those people politically, theologically, whatever it is. I have a disagreement, so we just split and we'll go form our own little group over here and we just form around our, uh, our unified beliefs and thoughts and we all just look alike and smell alike and that's easy. Very easy. But God calls us in his word in Ephesians chapter two and Paul has this vision from the Lord. No, you will need to stay in the tension of both. You will be required to have unity and at the same time, holiness. Grant and Jen are going to come help me illustrate this for you. What we, I don't know, I don't know who, who's the holy one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Grant or Jen, Jen is holy. Grant is unity. So what we have attempted to do is we have, we have this call to unity and holiness, but we have tended for the sake of unity to unhook from holiness, and we've lost the power of the church to actually bring transformation to the world. The church for thousands of years has brought moral transformation to the societies it has been in. Now, here's the challenge. Look at the society around you. Is that happening? I would say not to the degree it should be. We also have a tendency to unhook from unity. And the world looks at that and says, they're as divided as we are. They have nothing to offer us because they get in their groups that look alike just like we do. The world will not be changed by a disunified church. And the world will not be changed by an unholy church. We are called to remain in the tension 
And this is hard. Tension is hard. Tension is a challenge. But I want to show you who needs a t-shirt. <laughs> We're going to try this. Oh, okay. So when there's tension, there's power. Do you see what I'm saying? When, you, when we actually hold in the tension and we go through the challenge, we're not going to disunify and we're not going to lower our standard of holiness and it's going to be a challenge and we're going to have to work through things and there's going to be boundary lines that are drawn in the name of holiness, but, those are, but we're also going to press for unity and be able to work through with people we disagree with in every way, but we're going to stick together as the family of God. Oh, now I've got some power. Now... I can try to hit Gabe in the face. <laughs> All right. Where's the, okay, who wants a hoodie? I got a, this one's got a. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this one's got to demonstrate the point a little better. Oh, no. All right, hey, hey, I got to try that one more time. I got to try that one more time. We need it back. We need it back. We need it back. We need it back. This went way better in rehearsal. We hit the sound booth. We hit the sound. We hit the sound booth in rehearsal. <laughs> yep. uh, if this doesn't work, it's because Jen didn't bundle it right. It's not my fault. Okay, that was a little better. All right, thanks, guys. Come back to second service. It'll go farther this time. When we're joined together as the holy temple where the Holy Spirit dwells, there is power and there is hope. And again, I want to reiterate, it's not going to be easy. It's the great challenge, probably one of the greatest challenges we have always faced and will continue to face here at New Wine. Can we stand in the tension of unity and holiness hold together for the sake of generations coming. It's not just a challenge for us, it's a challenge for the church as a whole, especially in America right now. Will we model something that the world takes notice of? Will they see the difference in us? Will they recognize they have something we don't have. This is how the early church grew and spread. It wasn't because they voted the right person into office. It wasn't even because they stood in front of stadiums of tens of thousands of people and spoke the gospel. They proclaimed the gospel in their community, in their streets. But even when that wasn't happening, they were living in a way where their neighbors said, they have something. We divide over our social status, our wealth, and here are these people, they all unify in these houses around the name of Jesus. In the Roman culture, they divided over the gods they worshiped, their favorite ones. But in the church, they all came together around the one true God and their Lord Jesus. And people saw that. Now, is our world divided? People are going to see when people put aside their differences for the sake of Jesus. And people are going to see, wait a minute, the church you go to has Republicans and Democrats in it. And they actually love each other. Get along. Now, again, that's not easy. That's not easy. But it is something the world will take notice of. I want to introduce you to something that we'll talk about <clears throat> next week in a little bit more depth. But this is the great enemy of unity and holiness. It brings false unity and false holiness. I'm, I like to call it, and it's been called, the political religious spirit. 
Those are not two things, in my opinion. That's one thing. Political religious spirit. It is the great enemy of what God has called us to, unity and holiness. How big of an enemy is this? Well, it was the religious leaders and the political leaders that put Jesus on trial to send him to the cross. This is how big and powerful this issue is. Jesus said, though, well, it's not the political leaders and the religious leaders. It's not the people. It's the hour of the power of darkness because he recognized there's a spirit here. This is a spiritual thing. And so I just want to highlight a few things about the political religious spirit today. And next week, we're going to go in more depth and uncover it in the Bible But here are some things to help us know and recognize when the political religious spirit is influencing us. It loves to run rampant in the church, in God's people. And at times like the times we're in, I really believe the political religious spirit is putting even more pressure, more oppression on God's people. And so I just want to help to uncover it a little bit. The first thing that the political religious spirit does, are you all ready? Are you all good? This is towards the close of my, my sermon. This is a short one today, okay? So I just need you to absorb quickly. The first thing the political religious spirit does is it judges in an unholy way, in the name of holiness, but it's false holiness. It always judges in an unholy way. Now, Jesus teaches us the right way, a holy way, to judge. Uh, The Greek word is krino, which means to evaluate. Did you know we're always having to evaluate things, evaluate situations, evaluate what people are doing? But there is a right way to evaluate. And so Jesus says this, Matthew chapter 7, very famous teaching of Jesus. First he says, judge not or you'll be judged. Jesus loves to do this in his teaching. He throws out like a really blanket statement that grabs your attention. Hey, don't evaluate or you're going to be evaluated. And then he explains a little bit more. He says, because here's the thing, with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your eye, then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now notice, as Jesus works through this teaching, he's not saying, don't evaluate anything at all at the end. He's saying, there's a way that you can help get the speck out of your brother's eye, but you have to take the log out first. You see what I'm saying? To effectively be able to evaluate something, crino something, judge something, as right or wrong, as wicked or holy, the, f- the thing that you must do is really work to remove the log out of your own eye so that you can see the speck in your brother's eye. I think you can kind of sum up all of Jesus' teaching, and Paul grabs onto this, that as a follower of Jesus, my default position should be that judgment is a last resort, This is the last place I want to go, is to judge somebody's motives, judge their intentions, put judgment on there. That is a last resort. Why? Because that measure I use, God's going to use and hold up to me. Are you listening? But what we have tended to do as the church, in the church, in America, is flip it To judgment is the first thing we go to. That is the political religious spirit. 
It's backwards of Jesus' way. Judge first, ask questions later. Judge first, have a conversation later. It is a dark power that has a hold of the heart that is doing that. And we need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, deliver us from evil. Jesus is trying to get us to recognize that we tend to be a lot more generous and flexible in judging our own behavior than we are when we're judging other people's behavior. That's the log thing. Hey, can you slow down and recognize you're way easier on yourself than you are on other people? Remember, the same measure that you're using will be used against you. So be very slow, careful to judge. Let it be the last place you go. We still need to judge things. We still have to call things wicked and holy. We have to call balls and strikes. But it is the last place we want to go because we know what Jesus says about it. But the political spirit has no room for Matthew chapter 7. It causes people to assign motives to people they don't even know. Oh, they're doing this for the, this reason. They're doing that for that reason. And you've never talked to them. You don't know them. You're assigning motives. That's a sign of the political religious spirit tugging on your heart. It motivates people to judge themselves by their attention, intentions and others by their actions. That's that unequal weight thing. Well, my intentions were good, so I'll give myself a pass on what I did. I can give myself a pass on what I said. But other people, I'm going to judge them more harshly. That's a sign of the political religious spirit. Now, <clears throat> I hope you can hear me say this. We are in a series on politics, and I have told the leadership this, and I have told some people this. It is going to feel like I'm coming out every week swinging, right? And I, want, I hope you can hear me say this. I'm not swinging at you. I'm swinging at this spirit that is prevalent in our society and always wants to creep into God's people. Do you hear me saying that? Yes, I am coming at something, but it's not you. It's a spirit that wants to grab a hold of you. And it's a big deal, and it's a strong spirit. John calls it a beast, and we're going to look at that next week. But this political religious spirit is a beast, and it can hold great sway and power over people. And it's very deceptive to God's people. And so we have to be aware of it, bring our attention to it, and overcome. I hope you can hear me say that. But I have known since I started thinking about doing this series, there is great danger because the second thing that the political and religious spirit always does is it twists truth and words in order to divide. I have known since I started thinking about this series, people are going to hear me say things I did not say. Literally, words can come out and before they get to people's ears, they will twist in the air. That's not my fault. That's not your fault. There's a spirit. There's a spirit that twists truth and twists words so that it can divide. When that happens, it causes people to demonize those they disagree with. People become your enemy. When the Bible's very clear, we don't war against flesh and blood. There's spiritual powers, spiritual battles that are our enemy. It causes an us and them mentality. Anytime 
Listen, let me just be really direct. Anytime you are feeling or hearing things that are sounding like that's them over there, this is us over here, we're, we're, we think this, they think that, us, them, you are hearing the political religious spirit in your ear. That is not the Holy Spirit of God who, again, seeks to join us together into a holy temple. Am I bringing clarity and revelation to this spirit that's in the air? Be very careful. It convinces people to assign the blame for all of the problems in society to one people group. Everything that's going on is their fault. People under the religious under the influence of the political religious spirit hunt in packs so they can feed off the self-righteousness of other of others around them. They pack up and they fall into self-righteousness, giving them a sense of false holiness, and they actually hunt and attack those who are not in their group. This is not the Jesus way. This is not the way of the lamb. How y'all doing? Last one. The, relig the political religious spirit thrives in pride and hiddenness, but it is defeated by great humility. It is pushed back when we step into great humility. What does humility look like practically? It looks like seeking to understand. It looks like not having to be right on every single thing. It looks like being willing to learn, being open. Notice when Jesus is on the cross, his arms are open. This is what humility looks like, but the political religious spirit wants to trap us in pride and bury that pride so that we think we are being righteous when really we're only being prideful. It makes people fear things they cannot control. And here's the worst one, one of the worst ones. It's the most hidden thing. It causes people to redefine dishonoring attitudes as virtuous things. Oh, I was dishonoring to people. I was dishonoring to those who are made in the image of God. I did something dishonoring, but actually I was right. Political religious spirit. It's the, the face of the devil. We are never justified in dishonoring those who are made in God's image, period. And the political religious spirit seeks to cause you to think, I was righteous, I was right. But the lamb comes and says, remember what I did, remember how I walked came from heaven, the highest seat, humble, came to earth in a manger and was made low, low status, low value, low position, the lowest. Are you listening? For the sake of others. This is the way of the Lamb. And this is what leads to true unity. This is what leads to true holiness. This is what will guard against false unity and false holiness. We must have the political religious spirit revealed and cut out, and that hurts, and it's painful, but it has to be done because we have to follow the way of the Lamb. Amen? Amen? All right, you can stand. Here's what I want us to do. Worship team, you can head up here. As I said, we're going to really dig more into this political religious spirit in the book of Revelation next week. What I want us to do now <clears throat> is 
I'm going to give you three steps. Don't do them right away because it'll cause too much noise, all right? First thing I'm going to ask us to do is, in a second, I want us to gather with people around us, circle up, and I'm going to pray for us as a church, and I want us to be praying that that religious political spirit would lift off of our hearts and that it would go in Jesus' name. I believe we can ask that in Jesus' name. I also am going to ask that as you go through this week, as people of this body, be praying for your family, be praying for your church family, be praying for your nation, that that we would overcome this beast by the power of the Lamb, and that it would no longer have a hold on individuals, families, churches. We need that released in the church in America, not just our church. But believe me, this political religious spirit is affecting everyone. I include myself in that. But all we can do is become aware of it, have it revealed to us, pray against it, and invite the Holy Spirit to come and triumph. Amen? Amen. Okay, so I want you to group up with people. Just You don't have to walk around too much. Just turn. Families, invite other people into your family. Circle up. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to get into your group, and then I'm going to pray over us. <clears throat> okay, are you ready? Everyone, if you would, just assume the posture, put your hands out in front of you. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, come now, and I ask in Jesus' name that you would unify us together by your Holy Spirit, and you would build us into a holy temple today, that we would be holy and we would be unified, Lord. I pray for every person in here and every person that calls New Wine home, that that political religious spirit would break and be gone in the powerful name of Jesus. We rebuke you in Jesus' name and say you have no place here and we are going to stand for unity and we are going to stand for holiness and we are not going to be deceived by your false unity and your false holiness. We are going to follow the Lamb no matter how difficult it is, no matter how much tension it is, we are going to follow the way of Jesus into unity and holiness. Father, I bless everyone here every family, every couple, every individual, Lord. I bless them in Jesus' name. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Let them Fill them with your love. Fill them with your love for one another, Lord. I pray against unholy judgment in this place, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray against the twisting of words in Jesus' name, and I pray against pride, Lord. And I pray that you would fill us with the humility of Jesus. Not just for our sakes, not just so it's good in our day and it's good in our church, Lord. But lift our eyes to see we are doing this for the generations to come. We are leaving a world behind for generations to come. And I ask in Jesus' name, it would be a blessed place. It would be a place where the kingdom of God has been built for. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let this not just be a moment in church, but let us go out of this place and continue to pray, continue to press in, continue to stand strong and and saying this is what our world needs, a unified church and a holy church. A unified church and a holy church in Jesus' name. We can't do that on our own, Lord. It's all by your spirit. It's all by your power. We have nothing to offer, nothing to give in and of ourselves. So Lord Jesus, we need you and we need your presence with us, Lord. And so as we do every Sunday, I just open up and invite you again. Come, come Holy Spirit of Jesus and fill your people and touch your people. Thank you, Lord. Just continue to pray for two more minutes. Pray out loud. Pray for unity. 
lift your voice to your God. When you ask him, you will receive. Pray for unity. Pray for holiness. Thank you, Lord. 